my life to you, I give shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, uh, looking at the first 14 verses as we continue our study through uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and we are in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so Matthew chapter 7, which is very interesting. Um, because I have I've talked to atheists over the years, and I have found they know Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. <laughs> Judge not, lest you be not judged. Um, and if that's all you had to go by, you would say, hey man, don't judge me, right? Who are you to judge me? So, if that's the context you want, hey, don't judge the sermon today then, right? Um, <laughs> I don't want report cards later. But we're going to see if there's an actual context to that verse. And, and so we'll see how people misinterpret this scripture. And, and sadly, very sadly, many people will end up in cults or end up deceived uh, by just isolating a verse and taking it out of its context. So it's very important we consider the context. And so um, as we take a look at what Jesus says here on the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to really uh, dial in on how we're to treat others. And so with that, let's take a look at the first six verses here. In Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye. And look, there is a plank in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. We'll pause there. Again, we see the context uh, of how we're to judge and how we're not to judge others. Uh, I've said this before, but uh, it bears repeating. Just like good vision is 2020, when you find a verse in Scripture, read 20 verses before that verse, 20 verses after that verse, get the context of what is being said. You remember that even the devil knows Scripture, and he used Scripture against Jesus during the temptation wilderness period. Again, out of context, especially one of them because it it says in Psalm 91 that he would be trampled underfoot, but of course he didn't want to remind Jesus of that, that the devil was going to go down someday. So we want to read things in context, right? We want to make sure um, we understand uh, what is being said in the context. And this is talking about helping others, but also having discernment. Now, I want to read, because uh, there's another scripture that says almost the exact same thing. It comes from Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. If you're a note taker, when I encourage you to write that down, Galatians 6, 1. And the New Living Translation, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should help that person back onto the right and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So we need to be careful about how we judge other people. We need to ensure we're not doing the same displeasing thing to God that they are doing. For the standard that you use in judging someone, God says that's the standard you're going to be judged. So we want to be very cautious and careful in how we're doing that. Now, what do we do if somebody sins against us? And we'll dive into that when we get there, but... Uh, when somebody sins against us, the scripture says we're to go with them, go to them one on one, and deal with that sin privately. Right? We tell them, "Hey, you hurt me this way, uh, or you're sinning in this way." This is what the scripture says. And if they hear you, great, you've won back your brother or your sister. If not, then you tell it to 
uh, a few other godly people who are Christians, uh, mature believers. And if they don't, you tell the church elders, right? And then you go from there. But always the goal in that uh, is restoration, reconciliation, right? It's to see them restored. You recall King David. Often uh, children, what they know about King David, they'll mention, oh, David's the guy that took down Goliath, right? It was amazing. You ask adults, what do you know about King David? And they'll say, oh, yeah, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. <laughs> Little different perspectives, right? But you remember King David, uh, he, he had it all. He had uh, this leadership and, and had a beautiful palace. And one day he was looking out where he's supposed to be at war. And he saw a gal bathing. Um, and, and so he uh, went after her and, and uh, decided to take her from her husband. Later on, then David tried to cover up his sin by having um, her husband killed and put on the front line of the battlefield, and then he was murdered. And so then David thought, well, nobody else knows, I'm going to get away with this. But then Nathan the prophet comes to David, and he begins to share a story, which is a great way if you're going to help someone who's blind and, and, and sin uh, to realize where they're at. And so Nathan says, well, let me share a story with you, David. There was a, a, a rich man who had lots of lambs, lots of sheep, and very wealthy and there was this poor little guy who had one little lamb and, and loved it and took care of it. And a guest came to the, the palace of the rich man. And the rich man decided, instead of offering one of my lambs, I'm going to go and take the poor man's lamb. And David said, or Nathan said, David, how would you respond to that? I mean, that's, that's wicked. And then Nathan said, David, you're the man. And then David said, oh, I can't believe that. It is, it is me. And he was broken. And he, he repented from that sin. In fact, some of the most beautiful words that he penned are in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, showing the brokenness and the contrite heart that he had, how he realized how he had sinned against God and God alone and, and needed his cleansing and his forgiveness. And uh, it just shows the brokenness over sin. And, and that David was then forgiven. He was restored. However, he still had consequences from his sin. Uh, and, and he had some issues with his children later on as a result of all of that too. But at least David was no longer a hypocrite. He was no longer pretending to be right with God and, and, and faking it. And so, in fact, we see even Jesus says that here, uh, that word in verse 5, hypocrite. And uh, the word hypocrite uh, is is what we would commonly know as someone as an actor or a pretender. And so in the, the theater of the time, in the Greco-Roman world, when they would put on a, a theater or a play, um, they would usually have one person in different roles. And so they would have these different masks, and sometimes you'll see that in the theater today as well. They'll have the, the sad face or the happy face or the scared face or um, you know the, those kind of different masks they put on. And so they would come and they would put that on and do their lines and they'd go backstage and grab the other mask and put it on and do their lines. And they were known as hypocrites, right? They were known as actors. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's saying that we need to be very cautious. We need to make sure that we're not uh, pretending or ignoring sin in our life and then pointing out the exact same thing in somebody else's life. And he gives this imagery here um, of this very little speck in your eye and this like two by four plank of wood and, 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 the, and another eye. And uh, the, the imagery is real, but it's, it's kind of humorous. And I tried to find a picture I put up there on the screen. Um, but I mean, imagine you've got this big plank of wood in your eye and you're trying to remove this little speck from somebody else's eye. Like, oh, you got something there. Let me help you with that. Um, and, and that's the imagery that Jesus has here. And he's showing us how gentle we need to be and dealing with, with sin uh, in someone else's life. Yet, we're generally far more tolerant of our own sin than we are to the sin of others. And so, um, and if you've ever dealt with eyes, you know you have to be very gentle because um, you can cause uh, some damage. Uh, Pastor David Guzek said, we break this command when we think the worst of others, when we only speak of their faults, 
We break this command when we judge an entire life only by its worst moments. When we judge others without being mindful that we ourselves will be judged. So again, we, we want to be cautious in that. If, if you look at the one snapshot of David's life and you judge by that, you would miss the big picture. And thankfully, uh, God is the judge, right? And he will always judge righteously and fairly. So we need to realize that, that God has not called us to the ministry of accusation. God has not called us to the ministry of condemnation. God has called us to the ministry of restoration and reconciliation. Right? That's what God has called us to do. He's the judge, uh, not us. So we want to be very cautious. But also we need to realize Jesus did not prohibit the judgment of others. He only requires that judgment be fair. We judge others by a standard that we would also like to be judged by. So in order to help others examine our own life, make sure that we're not off track. And this is a powerful motivation that should help us be kind to people, right? To make sure that we're practicing forgiveness. We should be giving more of those things to others with that goal of restoration. Now, after he warns us against these judgmental attitudes and self-blind criticism, Jesus here in verse 6 says something very interesting. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before a swine, lest they trample them feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What is Jesus talking about here? Well, when we take a look at this, again, the context is, And so he's not implying that people in his kingdom not judge. He's reminding us uh, that we need to have discernment in judgment. We need to discern there are some good and precious things that should not be given to those who receive them with contempt. Uh, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 56, 10, uh, it says this. It says, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. So to paraphrase, in the Old Testament, God is calling the false leaders uh, dumb dogs who are lazy. They were so concerned with self that they neglected to actually care for the people. In fact, you see this carries on later. And woe to you, because... Uh, they were about trying to, to make themselves look holy and righteous. And they neglected. And so we see here that God is, is, is calling them uh, dogs. And it's interesting because in Psalm twenty two sixteen, a very prophetic psalm, uh, these would be the ones later who would encircle Jesus as he was crucified on the cross. So we see dogs. And, uh, and pigs were unclean animals to the Jews, so dogs and swine here are often understood as those hostile to the kingdom of God, those who are against God, and also the messengers of God like us. We realize that, that not everyone likes Jesus, and not everyone's going to like us because we're followers of Jesus. So we have to have wisdom and discernment in this world. Now, it would be odd, right, if you saw a pig wearing a necklace of pearls. That would be a little strange. Or you saw someone cooking up some prime rib just to feed it to their dog while they're eating out of a, a can of Spam. It would be a little strange, wouldn't it? I mean, I'm sure we like our animals, but that would, be, that would be a little odd. And so we can't ignore that we live in a broken world, that there is evil, that there is sin in this world. And I remember... A youth ministry in California, there was this gal, and, and, and she just took everyone and everything at its word. And I tried to encourage her to realize that you can't do that. Uh, go, do, go do a ride along with a officer, and you're going to find out pretty quick. Uh, there's a whole other realm to the world around us. right? Or watch, I don't know if it's on anymore, but there used to be a show called Cops. And you begin to realize that, that 
people's hearts, right, are when, when their when their back is against the wall and they're realizing trouble. They don't always make the right decision, right? Sometimes they will flee and they'll make things even worse. And we need to realize that that there's an evil world around us. There's agendas and motivations that we can't always discern and understand. And so we have to realize that we, we can't be ignorant to the evil and the fallen world around us. Now, he says that we need to be careful about giving those things that is holy to those that would despise what is holy. So what is holy? Well, the gospel message is holy. Uh, The people of God are holy. And it's only because we have a God who is holy. right? Jesus alone is the one who is holy and can make us holy, set us apart for him. So what he's saying here is we need to be uh, having discernment and wisdom and that our love for others must not blind us to the reality that heart of hearts will reject the good news of the kingdom of God. And, and maybe you've had that interaction with certain people, there are certain people that they're interested in spiritual things, they'll want to hear your testimony, hear about what God's doing in your life. Other people, you're going to talk to them, and they're like, I don't want to hear anything about that. You bring it up again, and I don't want, we're never talking again, right? And so you have to be cautious, you need wisdom and discernment in those conversations. And there are some people you just cannot share the things of God with them. They're not going to respect them. They'll make fun of what you're saying, and they'll just trample them under their feet. And they might even turn and tear you to pieces. They might come after you and become an enemy. So how are we to know then who we can share with and who we should not share the truths of God with? How do we do that unless we make some kind of judgment, you see? And yet... That's the judgment we need. We need wisdom and discernment in making those judgments. How are we to walk that narrow uh, without judging and and not being a fool and taking the pearls and giving them before swine? How in the world can we walk that and, and live that out? Well, the good Lord tells us actually in the next section uh, that what we can do to receive that wisdom. He says here in verse 7 through verse 11, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. For what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So we see that there is wisdom and discernment that we need. And Pastor Chuck Smith rightly said the the Greek words here for ask, seek, and knock, they're what's known in the present perfect tense which properly translated in English would be uh, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And it's not just a a once completed action, right? I prayed once and Lord, uh, I'm done. I'm done praying. No, this is a continual prayer life of asking the Lord, seeking the Lord and and knocking and, 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 and communing with the Lord Almighty. Now, we also know that our Lord Jesus already told us earlier in the Sermon on the Mount that we're not to pray with vain repetition, right? And so, so what does this mean? This is an illustration here that points out that as earthly parents, when our children come to us with needs, and we realize, we recognize they have certain basic needs, how do we respond? Do we, do we help them or do we neglect our children? For example, if one of my sons comes to me and says, Hey, Dad, I'm hungry. Can you make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Do do I hand them a rock and say, Hey, go chew on this kid? (laughs) No, right? I I would make them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Probably cut it in little squares or triangles however they want it to, right? Or if your your child comes to you and asks for for fish, right? Do you give them something else? Do you give them lutefisk? Sorry if you like to do this. Do you give them a serpent? Do you give them a snake? No, right? You give them them necessities. You give them what they need, right? 
Because why? You love your kids, right? You want what's best for your kids. And, and uh, it's hard to understand it if you're not a parent, but when you become a parent or even a grandparent, um, there's nothing you would do that you wouldn't do for them, right? That you, you love them so much. You realize that they are the future. And, and as a parent and grandparents, you've made sacrifices for your kids and for your grandkids. And, and gladly, right? Because you love them. And so we consider all of that here. There's a relationship. And, and we look at that which here. It's very vital for prayer. Notice what he says. He says, your father. Your father. And so we realize that as a, as a child of God, we have every right to come to our Heavenly Father. And children should have that very same right to come to their parents and ask them for help whenever there are needs. So again, he's, he's talking about speaking uh, in, in this communication of prayer. And it's a speaking of a relationship, the relationship that we have with God the Father. How much more should your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? God wants to give us good things. We need to be asking him. We need to be having that relationship with him. We're in just constant prayer and conversation with him. Now, I also need to swing to the other side of this and, and, and make mention. This does not mean we can just ask God for whatever we want and, and, and assume that we're going to get it. I know there's a whole false movement out there, the Word of Faith movement, where they've got the, the name it and claim it, right? Or uh, it's called the blab it and grab it, right? <laughs> I, I want a new car in Jesus' name, and then, like, where's my new car? Or a private jet, or whatever, right? It doesn't work that way, right? And James will talks about this very much, that you have not because you ask not, but then he says, ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. You're, you're asking for selfish reasons, right? We want to make sure our prayers are aligned with God's will. In fact, Oftentimes, as we close our prayers, we conclude with, in Jesus' name, amen, right? So be it. And so it's like we're signing a letter, sending it to our Heavenly Father, and we're praying all these things in alignment with Jesus and his will for us. And so when we pray, we want to make sure our prayers are in that alignment, right? We're not just praying for selfish things, but we also want to pray that God will give us our daily bread, right? And he says, that's okay. So we, we need to have that. Uh, that conversation with the Lord. And you also need to know uh, that we need to stay in that attitude of prayer. Uh, God desires us to continue to have a deep and rich prayer life with him. One of the things that um, I love about Billy Graham was he was always uh, very great in Bible uh, teaching and preaching and a very humble and wise guy. And, and he was asked once, Billy Graham, if you could go back and, and you could tell the younger Billy Graham, uh, what, would, what would you tell him? What would be important? And he said, I would preach more about the cross of Christ, and I would be more, spending more time in prayer. And I thought, wow, Billy Graham says he would have spent more time in prayer. How much more do we need to be spending time in prayer with the Lord Jesus Christ? So we need to, we need to have that conversation with the Lord every day. And you also need to know every time you pray to God, he does hear and he does answer. It's either going to be yes or no or wait. And that's the last one we don't always like. Learning patience. And so I would, I don't know if you want to pray for patience, but God will give it to you either way, <laughs> whether you want it or not. It's a very difficult thing. Teach us to be patient. But God's outside of time. He knows all things. He's in control. And we need to learn patience. And, and it comes with part of it. But you need to know your Heavenly Father loves you. And His plan for your life is far greater than you can ever imagine. And, and He's got a way better plan for your life than you can even uh, come up with. And so the best thing that you can ever do is to discard the plans that you have and, and ask God to reveal his plans for your life. There's no greater place to be than in the center of God's will. And I don't know what that looks like. That's where you have that conversation with God. God, what is, what is your plan for my life? 
What are the next things that you want me to do? What, what's the next step? And, and he may show you a few different things. I, I don't know if he's going to show you a 10-year plan. Probably not, but it'll probably just be take the next step. And then once you've taken that step, all right, now you're ready to take the next step. And so it's, it's, it's walking by faith. Right? It's talking to the Lord. And nothing, again, could ever be better to you than just be in the center of what God's will for your life is. And that's the kind of father that we have, that we can have that conversation with him. So we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, in, that, in that attitude of continuing to have uh, open and deep and rich conversations with our Lord. Well, next we'll take a look at something that's commonly known as the golden rule in verse 12. He says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophet. Now, notice there's a therefore here. Kind of a thought, right? The word of the summary of a conclusion. J. Vernon McGee, he would always say, whenever you find a therefore in Scripture, find out what the therefore is there for. Maybe you'll remember that next time. So what is the therefore here for? Good question. What's the context? What happened just right in front of us? We're told that we need to ask God, right? To, to have that prayer life with God, to receive from Him. And so the therefore is actually part of the golden rule. I think that's why many make a mistake with this golden rule, because they take the therefore out and they just quote, whatever you want men to do to you, do also unto them. But that's not the golden rule. And it, to quote it that way leaves out uh, this therefore and leaves you totally helpless. If you don't have the therefore in it, there's no way you're ever going to fulfill this apart from praying to God and receiving his help. Right? When God commands us to do something, he will empower us to do that command. For example, we're called to love our enemies. Good luck with that on your own, by the way. <laughs> Try that sometime. Uh, it's hard, very difficult. We need God's help to do that, right? And so we need to receive his help uh, as we're going to live out this golden rule. Now, there are some people that will tell you Christ didn't declare anything new. This golden rule has been around a long, long time. And they'll say this was a common saying among great teachers and philosophers of the past. Confucius, for example, said, don't do to men what you don't want done to you. Aristotle said much the same, what you don't want done to you, don't do to others. Uh, Socrates said, whatever is displeasing to you, then don't do that to others. So people say, well, the same general thought has already been expressed, right? Jesus is just repeating what uh, uh, wisdom and sages of the past have, have already said. But actually, that's wrong, right? If you read Socrates or Aristotle or Confucius, you see, they all put this in a negative way, Right? In other words, I don't want you to kill me, so I'm not going to kill you. And even thieves know this part. They don't want to be stolen from. They don't want someone to take their stuff. Right? And I don't want you to take my stuff, so I'm not going to take your stuff. Right? And you see, that's, that's that, that negative. But Jesus puts it in the positive. Right? So following Confucius, you wouldn't want someone to steal from you. Following Jesus, you would want someone to be generous, to be helping and giving to you. So can you see there's a difference? One state in the negative, one state in the positive. One's in the negative that you're uh, reactive. One state in the positive where you're to be proactive. And so we, want to, we don't want to be passive in our relationship with others. We want to be active in our relationship with others, proactive. And we want to be doing things towards people for good, for kindness, for, for love, and for giving. We want to be generous to people. So again, it would be impossible to fulfill this commandment of Christ apart from the power of God in my life. And therefore, it takes you back to that therefore. We're to ask, right? And you shall receive seek, and you shall find knock, and it shall be open to you. It takes us back to that because we cannot do this on our own. We don't have the capacity or the power in this to do it ourselves. Therefore, we need to ask God to work in our life, by the power of His Holy Spirit.
right? to be filled and empowered by the Spirit to, to live a life of glory. The power of God's love working in us and then working through us. Uh, because apart from that, we can't live up to the requirements that are asked of us here on the Sermon on the Mount. So we need God's help and, and the help of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to help us uh, to live this out. So we see that God desires us to have wisdom. God desires us to, to have that prayer life. God desires us to, to live out a way where we're interacting with others and helping them. But we'll see next, there, there's also two different paths. Everyone's on one path of these two. And so we want to make sure we're on the right path. And we'll see that next here in verse 13 through verse 14. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We'll pause there. Now, as we read this, to enter into that straight gate or that narrow gate, in my mind, it reminded me of John chapter 14, where Jesus told his disciples, uh, I'm, I'm going to go away. And, and Thomas, the disciple, says, well, where are you going? I, I don't know where you're going. I don't, I don't know the way. And, and Jesus answered in, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And it's interesting, we actually see those three components actually here as well. As Jesus talks about this, this straight gate, or this, this narrow gate, reminds us that there is the way, and Jesus is the way. And then we see, he says, be careful of the wide gate, or, or this broad path. There, there is a false way. We need to realize that there is truth, and Jesus is the truth. And then he's talking about entering into life, a gate that leads to life. Life that can be established here and now, and life everlasting. Jesus is the life. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Pastor Jack Hibbs said, over the years at Calvary Chapels, we've been accused of being too narrow. There's an emphasis today, a strong emphasis, that there's a wide way that ultimately everybody in every path will lead to God. But that is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus said the exact opposite. There is a straight gate. There is a narrow path that leads towards life. If there was any other way, as Jesus said, let this cup pass. But nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. There was no other way. And if there was another way, why did Jesus come? Why did he suffer and die on the cross for our sins? There was no other way. This was the only way for us to have salvation. And so we see that um, there's a narrow path that leads toward life. And there aren't many who walk it. However, there's this wide, this broad gate, this broad path that leads towards destruction. It's full of people. There are many people who have this philosophy, I can just live my life however I want, I can try to be a good person, and, and all paths will lead towards the Lord. It doesn't work that way. In fact, Scripture tells us no one is good but God. And the Ten Commandments reveal that, right? It's like a mirror. It shows us uh, we've, we've blown it. And, and all paths don't lead the same place. If, if you want to come over to my house after service, I say, yeah, just head five minutes in any direction. You'll end up in my house. It doesn't work. Right? I say, hey, go to the bank. Go to any bank in town and enter in any four random digits. And, and you'll get money in my bank account. Probably won't be anything in that account anyways, but... It doesn't work, right? So we see this relative truth out there today. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Sorry. There's absolute truth, right? And, and that's what we need. Jesus is that absolute truth. And so we want to make sure we're on the right path. We're not on that, that broad way, the popular way, right? It's going to lead towards destruction. J.C. Ryle uh, said, if friends will not walk... And the narrow way with us. Walk on the broad way to please them. 
Health is not infectious, but disease is. So we want to be cautious, right? Who we're hanging out with? Who who are we walking this, this road with? We want people who are walking this narrow path with us towards Christ. So in closing, we could probably go on for at least another hour, but I know we've got communion today, and I don't want to rush communion. We'll finish chapter 7 next week and and conclude the Sermon on the Mount. So my hope and my desire is that the Lord would help us have wisdom and to have discernment as we desire to help people around us. God, to fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit and empower us so that we can treat others in a way that glorifies Him, a way that we would want to be treated. And may we follow Jesus on the Calvary Road as we travel down the narrow path, following Christ, our Good Shepherd, and the path towards the paradise of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can study and take a look at the, the Sermon on the Mount. And God, we pray that if there be anything in us that is uh, of evil doing or wrong doing, Lord, that you would cleanse us from that. If we've been a little too judgmental or or, uh, not helping others or thinking ourselves better than we are, Lord, forgive us. Cleanse us. And Lord, we pray that you would fill us afresh with your spirit, empower us to love like you, to see people with your eyes, And to use our hands to help people around us. That we would be generous, Lord, and and kind to people. And Lord, help us to also have wisdom in the sermon. Knowing that not everyone wants to follow you. Help us, Lord, to stay on that straight and narrow path. As the world wants to make the path wider and wider. So that everyone can get there. Lord, help us to realize that, Jesus, you came and lived a perfect sinless life. You suffered and died on the cross for our sins. And that you did make a way, you made the way for us to be forgiven. You rose from the dead. And you offer us forgiveness of our sins and everlasting life. A relationship that starts here and now with you and for all eternity. And God, we pray if there be anyone here this morning who has yet to make that decision or, or, or needs to recommit their life unto you. We pray, Lord, that today would be that day of salvation. Whether you're here in person or or watching the live stream online or listening to this message later as it's archived, if you would say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right with God. I need to receive Christ as my Savior and my Lord. That's you this morning, ready to make a decision, ready to, to trust in Christ as your King. I want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and and truly in your heart. God, I realize that I am a sinner. That my sin separates me from you. And God, I realize that you love me. That Jesus, you suffered and died on the cross. Paid the penalty for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the dead. God, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. That you would wash me clean from all my wrongdoing. Purify me and make me whiter than snow. God, I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for loving me. I surrender all of my life to you. Help me from this day forward to follow you. You put your spirit that I may do your will. I thank you for being my Savior. I thank you for being my Lord. And I thank you for being my King. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Mulder of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word, cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries, check out ccfergusfalls.com. 
May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside out.